Well, good morning once again. So glad to have this opportunity to uh, speak with you. This end of the year, uh, which we look back on the previous year, and I don't know if you're like me, but try to find ways like, was it worth it? What was the value? What did we really accomplish? That kind of stuff, right? And then we look forward to the new year. Uh, I don't know what it all it is. Is it just the new year? Is it Christmas? Um, I've been thinking about this. Christmas is over now. We have a desire. Are you like me? I, every Christmas, I have a desire to revisit the traditions, right, that I grew up with, right? It's like, yes, now it's this time. And, uh, but at the same time, I have a young family trying to create new traditions and stuff. Like uh, this year, the first year that we actually put up Christmas lights. So last year we tried those uh, laser things, you know, and uh, I would always walk by the front door window and get hit in the eye. And it's like, it's, it's kind of felt weird. So we did actual lights. That was good. We did the net things over the bushes. I felt kind of accomplished, even though it was only like four strings. So, but baby steps, right? Right? Next year, maybe the whole works. We'll see. Uh, one of the traditions that we love, that I love, is classic Christmas movies, right? Does anybody else go for the classic Christmas movies? Yes. Uh, it was kind of busy this year, though, so we only got a few in. We got... Uh, we usually get White Christmas, but Christy had to watch that on her own without me. Rudolph and Frosty, we got two kids under 10. Uh, and The Grinch, only original for me, please. Uh, but one of our favorites, Christy's and I's, we just got to this last week and we had to split it over two evenings, which is kind of sad. But uh, it was a 1983 classic uh, Christmas story. Yes, yes. I love the narration in that one. At one point, it, this, this line stuck out to me. Um, old Ralphie, who's narrating, uh, right after some childhood conundrum, I don't remember exactly what it was, the problem that they ran into, he said, but no matter, Christmas was on its way, lovely, glorious, beautiful Christmas, upon which the entire kid year revolved. And with a eight-year-old and a five-year-old, uh, they... They start making lists next week, for next year. It's like, did you not get enough? Come on. You can't even clean your room, but yet you have more. Uh, um, anyway, but it, it's kind of the same with adults, isn't it? Not just the looking forward to presents part, but this slowing down maybe, being with family, reflecting on what the year has been, right? Uh, Maybe, uh, hopefully, you have a, a job where you have more time off during this time, and we get to slow down. We spo spend more time with our family and friends, and so maybe we rediscover how important relationships are. I think that may be part of it. Uh, whatever it is, there seems to be, I think, a common reaction between us, um, amongst us, that we look back over our year, and like, that's, this is where the year has gotten us to. Was it worth it? What, what did we achieve? What did we, what did we get? Have we grown as people? Um, a uh, Christmas song struck me this year as a John Lennon song, So This Is Christmas. It goes, so this is Christmas. What have you done? Another year over and a new one just begun. While I don't subscribe to John Lennon's theology, I do resonate with that sentiment. I want to know that the previous year has meant something, right? Uh, have I invested more of my time in worthy endeavors, uh, wasted less of it on frivolous pursuits? Have I grown wiser, learned to endure more, practiced greater generosity? Christmas time is big on that, right? I've become rich in relationships, made a habit of trying to meet someone's real needs. These are all things that uh, I think we would all want to do more of and be able to look back and say, yes, I have grown in that. But it is all so hard at times to know what criterion, how do we measure a year? How do we measure the effectiveness and the worth of a year? Uh, we are bombarded daily with competing scorecards. So corporations want us to measure worth by how we look or dress, how much weight we lose, how much muscle we gain. Society seems most focused on how much we achieve academically, professionally, or socially. Whatever means we use to measure last year, don't we then start thinking about next year? Like, well, I did good in that area, or I didn't do as well as I wanted in this area, so now let's look forward to next year and do better. Am I alone in this? Is this, it's kind of, yeah. 
So how many uh, had a New Year's resolution in sometime in the last five years? Are those still in? Yeah? Now how many of you were able to continue your resolution after a month? Hey, a few of you. Good job. <laughs> nice. I think we should start new moon resolutions, right? Every month. Or maybe some, some of you like me need a new Monday resolution. We can, we can, we can, I can do that for a week. Yes. Sometimes I can't. So here are the most common resolutions for 2020, according to a recent ABC poll. Exercise more, lose weight, 36%. No surprise there. Save money, 27%. Travel, 18%. Get a new job or hobby, 8%. Find love, yes. Or make new friends, 7%, 4%. Now these are good things, I think. But as a follower of Jesus, I have to ask what scorecard I should be using if I want to honor him first, right? That's what we want to do. In fact, before I put much thought into what I want to do or what I think is best, I need to first ask if there's anything God has already told me to do. You guys probably know where I'm going with that. There is, obviously, things he has told us to do. But uh, it can be hard to prioritize. How do we make that into a goal for the coming year? A few months ago, we went through a series titled Made for More, which looked at ways that our church um, and individuals, like many uh, in our modern society, we can get sidetracked by lesser goals and methods um, when God has designed us for so much more. So, in a sense, it's a way of rediscovering what has God really said? What, had, how, what did God create his church to do? Are we living in that, that paradigm? If we take seriously God's instructions to us, we will experience real, eternal success for God's kingdom and his glory. I don't think any of you disagree with that. And we will experience the greatest blessings he has to offer. So, when planning and hoping for a new year, I think this is a good place to start, right? What does God want for us? What has God instructed us to do? But it means putting his priorities first, and that can be difficult. If you have even a minimal familiarity with the Bible, you know there are many commands in there. Uh, one estimate, Old and New Testament put together, something like 1,500 commands, right? It's really hard to have a list like that and keep track of that throughout the year. Fortunately, Jesus focuses it all down for us beautifully in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. If you, uh, so I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles, uh, pull it up on your phone. If you use the Bible in front of you under the chair, it's on page 990. You guys are probably familiar with this passage. One of the Pharisees poses a question to Jesus. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, those 1,500 or so commands all stem from this principle. Love God first, love others like we love ourselves. It's not easy. Far from it. It is easier, but it is remember, easy to remember than 1,500 commands, right? This passage is known as the Great Commandment, even though it's kind of two commandments. It's really based on one idea, that God comes first. And so when we love others like we love ourselves, we're loving others based on their being made in God's image. So it's really an honor to him. But that's also a little bit wide, isn't it, right? Love God first, love others as myself. That's hard to make any kind of goal. How to increase, how to improve next year, right? What do we actually do? It, it doesn't tell us enough specifics, I think, for us to make like a resolution or, or a specific goal. It doesn't tell us whether we should wear the blue shirt or the red shirt, right? But it does say when you dress, however you dress, needs to be in a way that honors God and, care, and shows care for others, which is actually an important message for this society, don't you think? <laughs> so enough of that. Um, in order to figure out what specific goals we should have for this year, I think a lot of people would ask for something more detailed. Uh, do you hear people saying this? I hear a lot of people say, I wish I just knew God's will for my life, right? Uh, that's a great question. What does God want us to be about? Not just in a very general way, although that's very important and it should color everything that we do. What does he want me to do this year? 
How should we invest our time and energy? Fortunately, again, Jesus provides a good answer. If you're in your Bibles, turn a few pages over uh, towards the back to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We just looked at the great commandment. Something, uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should have that memorized. You should know that. Now we are looking at what is referred to as the Great Commission. At this point in the narrative, just for setup, Jesus has been resurrected. He has been appearing to the disciples and many others over a 40-day period. And this passage tells us his final command to the disciples before he ascends into heaven. So, final words? Somebody? Important, right? Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, looking at that verse there, why does Jesus get to set the priority for us? Because God has given him all authority. What is it that Jesus expects us to be doing? Make disciples. Where, did he say? All nations. So, in other words, all borders. Nothing's going to be out of bounds for us, for our goal. How do we do that? We baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, this one often gets forgotten, teach them to obey everything he commanded us. How can we do that? That's a big task. Because he is with us. His power is with us. We are empowered if we are a follower of Jesus with his spirit that gives us the power to do this. Until the very end of the age, that is, when Jesus returns. He implies there. There will be an end of the age. Or we do not have unlimited time. We don't know when that'll be. This may be our last day here. We don't know. Now that helps us flesh out a, little, a scorecard a little bit more for our potential, potential New Year's resolutions if you're still in the market for one. We have standing orders from Jesus what we are to be about. So if, if you get to that point, and I've been there, it's like, man, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this next phase of life. I don't know if I've been doing the right thing. How do we know? Well, Jesus told us before he left. Make disciples. What makes for a successful year in God's eyes? Making disciples. That means disciples being baptized. It means disciples being taught to obey everything Jesus commanded us. Disciples learning to trust that Jesus is and will be with us through his spirit until he comes again. Now we have uh, some specifics, a little bit of the message. But before we move on, using that criteria, how did we do in 2019? I know I could have done better. I should have done better. Now, this doesn't mean... Well, I'll get more details later. It doesn't mean that every one of us has to individually make a disciple doing the whole work. We're supposed to be working together. So just so... My aim on this is not to make anybody feel guilty, to be leave here feeling guilty. Instead, I want you to realize God's grace is just as powerfully available to you. If you feel like a failure at this point, please... God is gracious. God is patient. God wants to grow. But that's often how he starts a growth pattern in us. He brings to our mind a realization, something we're not doing that we should be doing, right? So if you're feeling that, please know that's a part of the process and God wants to help you get to a better place and able to do this. Uh, and so hopefully you leave this message encouraged and not just feeling guilty. If you feel, leave feel, just feeling guilty, I haven't done my job. So, oh, moving on. So if we imagine Portland Community Church as a boat, right? We want to get to a destination. We're not just out spinning circles, joyriding, right? We are going somewhere. We all have to be rowing in sync with each other and in the same direction, right? So if, we have, if we're going towards two different goals, we're canceling each other's out. We're, we're not helping each other get there. That's why this church was made for more. For more what, specifically? For making more disciples. Glad you asked. So I heard a story recently that illustrates this point. A uh, manager of a shoe factory was called in to the owner's office for end of year review. And the manager came, comes in really confident, right? And says, 
hey, uh, boss, we have the cleanest factory, most beautiful factory you could imagine. Uh, it is a great place to work. Our workers have great morale. And the owner said, oh, that's great to hear. Uh, what did that help you accomplish? And the manager says, well, it is pristine to come into work, right? Visitors, when they come in, it's, it's so comfortable in the factory. They love it. The owner said, that's good too. Did that help you uh, be successful this year? And the manager says, oh yeah, we haven't had any sick days. We have the best attendance. We have no work-related injuries. Our workers report some of the lowest levels of fatigue in the nation. The owner says, great. How many shoes did you make? The manager gets a little thrown. Well, we didn't actually make any shoes, uh, but we have training sessions almost every week on how to make shoes. And the owner said, well, what good does that do if no shoes actually get made, right? So you get my point. Obviously, a shoemaker is not, f if they're not focused primarily on making shoes, you can't really term them a shoemaker, right? In the same way, if we as disciples are not about making disciples, we're not really doing what Jesus instructed us to do before he left. At least not in the way Jesus intended. We may have good intentions. Remember, we have standing orders from Jesus, right? Make disciples. It's not going to change. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That is the command Jesus left us with. That's what he established his followers in this church to do. But let's get some clarity here. It may not be totally clear what is meant by the term disciple. So I need to clarify a couple things. A disciple simply means a follower of Jesus. All right? Contrary to some, how some people understand it, a disciple is not a next level of Christian. Like there's everyday Christians, the normal people, and then there's disciples that are the uh, super Christians. It's actually kind of reverse. People, they were termed disciples before they were termed Christians. So in Acts 11:26 uh, says, so for a whole year Barnabas and Saul, and that's also, he's also known as Paul, met with the church in Antioch and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So a disciple, that's what they were first called, and then they were termed Christians because you can be a disciple of a lot of different philosophies, a lot of different people, stuff like that. So if you are a Christian, you are a disciple. The Bible knows nothing of Christians who are not disciples of Jesus. If this all sounds new to you, don't worry. Uh, you may be wondering, uh, what does a disciple actually do? Fair question. Uh, I like this simple definition I found this week. Uh, a disciple of Jesus is a worshiper, a servant, and a witness. So now we start to get into some specifics. How do I actually be a disciple? How do I actually do this? One, display a life of worship. Okay? Worship comes from the word worth-ship. You're declaring the worth of something. In this case, specifically, the worth of God. And how we order our life, how do we work, how we interact in our neighborhoods, how we drive, how we spend our money, all these things can... Um, if we are careful with it and intentional about it, can point to God as our, our Lord. Secondly, a disciple of Jesus is a servant. Jesus, we see this example in him. He was a servant to those around him. Uh, think of the Last Supper when he got down. He washed the feet. Uh, only servants would do that in that day. He washed the feet of his disciples. And he said, as I've done for you, do to others. We're supposed to be meeting physical, real needs of those around us. In the church, specifically, but also all around us. Any need we, we see. Thirdly, a disciple of Jesus is a witness. We need to be testifying to who Jesus is, what he has done for us. That's what a witness does, right? They just say what has happened to them, what they've seen. They re, uh, re-declare that, right? So, still, it may be unclear to you. How do you do this whole make disciples thing, right? I understand the worshiper, the servant, and the witness thing. How does that make disciples? We spend enough time together in this room, and even if this is your first time here, you could probably tell we're not all wired the same, right? A cookie-cutter approach won't work. We have different skills. We have different limitations, jobs, and families that keep us busy in different ways, right? This is why we need to be part of a church. 
because our differences work together to fill in all of the gaps and uh, be able to reach a greater number of people in different ways. A church is a group of disciples working together to accomplish the Great Commission of making disciples. Specific ways that I can contribute to making disciples will be different than how Jim can contribute, how Dan can contribute. He's a cook, men's morning, morning wash breakfast, right? Great way to con contribute. I wouldn't be helpful. There wouldn't be a men's morning breakfast if I had to cook. So that's great. Pancakes every week. Uh, slightly chewy. That's how, that's how it would be. Oh, you get my point. Uh, great example. Liz and Kirsten, who do the food almost every week, volunteer. They don't get paid. And that's, we get more comments on the food. People who come in for five minutes, you know, on a Sunday, dropping off something or whatever. What? Did you guys do that? Special occasion? Nope. Every week. Wow. You know, that draws people in. That, that opens people up. That creates space for conversations. That is one way to help making disciples. Creating that space, that environment that is welcoming and loving and meets a need. So instead of talking you more about this at you, let's, uh, let's turn to God's word and, and go through a passage. So it's kind of a long passage. We're not going to be able to spend as much time as I would love to on this, but this is Romans chapter 12. So I would encourage you to open a physical Bible, open your phone, a Bible in front of you. The words are up there, but I would like you to be able to go through this later. So it helps with, uh, with muscle memory, mind memory, to, to look at the same one that you're doing that you will be looking at later. This is also finally, if you're a uh, bulletin filler inner with the blanks, this is finally the spot where there's some blanks to fill in. I was excited this week because I, uh, I finally got something to Christine in time for her to print it off in the bulletin, so I'm, I'm growing in my pastoral abilities. I was so excited that I overdid it. There's way too many blanks to fill in. <laughs> I will give you time after we read it. Romans 12. This is Paul writing to the church at Rome, how they do this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You want to know God's will for your life? It starts with submission and surrender to him. He says your bodies. He means your whole being, right? He talks about your mind there. It is because of God's mercy. He first gave us Jesus. Jesus gave his all for us, even when we were still against him. Even when he knew that we would choose to sin, he gave us everything. So we are to give everything back to him. And it means allowing him to transform us so that we can learn to discern what his will is for us. Moving on to verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, remember, no cookie-cutter approach, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. When you see prophesying, think speaking God's truth boldly. All right? If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Paul tells us here that there are, we all have different spiritual gifts to be used for making disciples. God has not given us a task and then left us to work on our own strength. When he commands something, he helps us to do it. You know what this means? You already have the tools you need to make disciples. You don't need to go to seminary. You don't need to go to a Bible class. Now, we will train and we will, we will learn, and there are things you will learn. You will get better at it as you do it. But instead of waiting till you feel ready, like so many things in life, the best way to get ready is to get in and start doing it, right? 
I've heard it said so many times, if you want to learn something really well, sign up to teach it. Getting in and going is how you learn and how you grow. Uh, what do you notice about this list of gifts? What jumps out at me is that they're all relational. It's a gift. The gifts are given so that we will interact with each other for each other's growth, encouragement, and to meet needs. That's what the spiritual gifts are for. Now, there are graces God gives us, there are blessings God gives us that are directly between us, definitely. We, us and him, vertical. But the spiritual gifts that are listed in, in scripture are about building up the body, growing with each other. Really, ultimately, about making disciples. We all have a role. We all have a way we can help out that is unique to us and that is needed in the body for us to really do it to the fullest extent we can. Now, God can definitely use gospel tracks, dreams, YouTube videos. You hear a lot about dreams in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, I've known people who came to Jesus, came to a, a seek out Jesus based on something that was just like a one-on-one one -on -one thing. But how do they grow once they've come to Jesus and they know they want to, be, to have Jesus and know Jesus? They grow in relationship within a church. That's God's plan. That's what God designed us to do. How did Jesus make disciples? For three years, he invested 90% of his time into 12 guys, according to Eugene Peterson. So, if we make disciples the way Jesus did, it's going to take that time investment. We don't learn a new, a better way to make disciples than Jesus did it, right? So, are you ready for more specific examples how we can do this? Let's turn to uh, verses 9 through 21 in Romans 12. Keep an eye and an ear open for how God might nudge you as we go through this list. My guess is that you'll see either some areas of weakness in your life, or maybe you'll see an area of strength, like, oh yeah, I can do that. Verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. In other words, sacrifice time and energy to serve others. Or maybe a better word for it, invest your time and your energy to meeting the needs of others. Never be lacking in zeal, verse 11, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Would others describe you as zealous for God? Do you have friends or coworkers who'd be surprised to hear that you're a Christian, or neighbors, family members? Verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Here's a convicting one. How's your prayer life? I believe our prayer lives are often the clearest measurement of our relationship with God. Do you want to be closer to them this year? That's a good goal, right? Do you need more hope and patience in your life, just like it says in that verse? Prayer is key. D.A. Carson, a, uh, a writer and a theologian, well-known, has argued that the greatest need of the American church today is a renewed devotion to prayer. I think he's right. Verse 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. It's not all about just a spiritual word. There's physical needs amongst us, around us, that need to be met. And God has gifted us, some of us more than others, to meet those physical needs in unique ways. So, are you generous with what God has given you? We're not just talking about money. We're talking about time. We're talking about energy. We're talking about... Um, Skills that you might know how to do that someone else needs? Do you practice hospitality? Now, hospitality in the Bible is different than I think some people might think of it today. So, uh, a lot of hospitality that's spoken of today is really like entertaining people in your house, which is nice that you can build relationships that way. Hospitality in Jesus' time was love of the stranger. That's what it literally means. Now, Thinking what that could entail, that's kind of intimidating for me. Uh, just bringing a stranger into your house. <laughs> Love of the stranger. Hospitality. That's what, uh, that's what that word literally means. It's in, so I would admit that's, that's intimidating to just bring, want to bring a stranger in your house. Maybe a good first step, though, 
if you're like me and are intimidated by that. What about just a commitment to sharing more meals with people that you would like to encourage or that you might want to reach? Food for thought. Oh, food for thought. <laughs> Oh, verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. You know why I think a lot of us are ineffective at making disciples? Because it takes time. It takes commitment. It takes being present in the lives of others. I don't think there's any, there's no influence, I think, without proximity, without connection, right? We have to be with someone. This means getting our hands dirty as we work alongside them to clean up the mess of sin and broken relationships, right? It, it's gonna get us dirty. It means the shoe factory is going to get cluttered, right? It means the boat is gonna start smelling as we're rowing hard together. So we have to ask ourselves, is there room in our schedules for new intentional relationships? Is there room in our heart to actually give sacrificially to someone? Even if they're not able, maybe, not, we'll, maybe they'll never be able to give back what we give them. As my dad used to say, that's too convicting, let's move on. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. How important is that going to be in this coming year? Election year? It's just going to ramp up from here, isn't it? It's already at a terrible fever pitch. Peacemakers are going to be at a premium, right? That's not how I meant that. <laughs> Someone who makes peace. Not the handgun, Dan. All right, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Do not take revenge. Moving on, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So many different ways that God's people are called to have a real impact relationally in the people around them, right? Uh, elsewhere in Scripture, it talks about having the, the scent of the, um, like incense, the, the, the smell of, of Jesus of life, right? Uh, that's how our churches should be, right? And when you're stepping out in that way, loving people in relationships, you may not be able to connect the dots, how is this making disciples, like Jesus said, but this is how God designed it. This is how Jesus told us, coming together, if we're all providing a different part of that puzzle, disciples will be made. They will come to know Jesus. They will come to understand what it means to worship him, what it means to be a servant, right? What it means to be a witness, because they will have experienced that from us. I do not know where God might be calling you to make disciples, but I know this, no matter where we are in life, we each have standing orders. Make disciples. This takes real investment, real concern for the needs of others, both physical and spiritual. The Apostle Peter summarizes Paul's instructions well in his own letter. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11 says this. Notice the similarities. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. That's implying we've all received a gift. None of us are left out of this, right? No ordinary Christians and super Christians, right? We have level playing field. We all have a role to play. Use whatever gift you have uh, received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Whatever the next year brings for us, 
we can know Jesus' instructions still apply. Make disciples, baptize them, teach them how to live by his power until he comes. Worth shooting for? Yes. Well, let's pray and ask God to bless us in that in this coming year. Heavenly Father, none of us have followed your directions perfectly. There are many ways, Lord, that we stumble each day. With our mouths, what we say, with our priorities, what we look at with our eyes, Lord, what we think in our heads. Lord, we are, in so many ways, imperfect vessels of your gospel, of your mercy. How can we serve others when, Lord, we are so easily thrown by temptation and by imperfections? This is why we thank you, Lord, that you are patient with us, that you lead us, that you lift us, that you have gifted us with your spirit in specific ways to lead others with needs that we may not even be aware of, but you know, and you place us in the paths of people that need what you have given us. They need your strength handed out through us. So Lord, I pray that we would be willing to sacrifice, to invest our time, our energies, our resources into making real change in the lives of others. Lord, we may not know exactly how uh, you have gifted us, but I know that waiting until we know might take years. So help us, Lord, to have the strength, the courage, willingness to get in there and start doing something. And in that process, as we are serving, we can discover more easily how you have gifted us specifically. But Lord, I pray that you would give us a renewed heart that is willing to give and give and give, even when we don't receive in return. To change our schedules, to change our priorities, so that those around us can know that there is a Savior that there is hope, that there is eternal life through the gospel, and that it is free to them if they would simply turn and accept it. And Lord, I pray that through this, uh, this next year, 2020, would, we'd be able to look back on it next year at this time and say, yes, I can see. I may not have accomplished everything that I thought or I hoped I would, uh, in my other areas of life, but I can see how God used me to make disciples in these specific ways. I pray that for all of us, Lord, and I pray that we would leave here not guilty, but encouraged that you are with us and that no matter uh, where we go, what we're doing, we can serve you in this way. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.